Um, now, it has actually been a really... My book, Radicals, came out two weeks ago, and it's been an exceptionally difficult time in the UK to talk about radical ideas because of what's happened in Manchester and then, of course, in London uh, a couple of days ago. And my book is really about the power of radical ideas, the importance, the value of radical thinking in liberal democracies. But, of course, that has a, a, a very negative and destructive side, too, that we've seen. And what's really important for me at this point is to make sure that violent Islamists do not define what ideas can and can't be discussed in society. It's incredibly important that radical thinking, thinking outside the norm, outside the established wisdoms, remains something that we all agree and can accept is incredibly important for the vitality of a modern liberal democracy. That's the argument of the book, essentially. And the reason I wrote this book, and I started writing this three years ago, I had no idea what was going to happen in the last 12 months. None. I just, all I knew is I'd been working at Demos for 10 years. That's a think tank, and, and most people leave think tanks after two years. So that's like in dog years, like in think tank years, that's about 150 years I've been working at a think tank. And the purpose of Demos, set up in the early 90s, was to try to slow down the decline in confidence and trust in formal politics. Uh, this was in the early 90s. And by every single measure imaginable, Demos has completely failed in that mission. Because every statistic that you see about trust and confidence in our MPs, in our justice system, in our institutions, even in democracy itself, is heading downwards. And it was clear to me that space was opening up for new radical ideas, new ideas outside the sort of centre-left, centre-right framework of modern politics. Is that noise going to distract you? Is it just nice background? Think of it as nice background music. You know, like a sort of jazz, we're in a jazz club or something. So, that being the case, I decided to spend a couple of years following around groups of radical thinkers, radical movements. Uh, now, it's a very difficult thing to define radicalism because it's obviously a term that's relative, relative, radical relative to what? And to me, I sort of struggled with that definition a great deal, but in the end, I looked at some sci uh, social science research and some political scientists who say that we have this thing called the Overton Window. It's the Overton Window. It's named after Joseph Overton, a political scientist from the US, who said, over the last 25 years, there have been a number of policies that if you wanted to get elected, you had to basically sign up to them. You could disagree a little bit, but fundamentally, on issues of welfare in the UK, the NHS, diplomacy, uh, tax and spend, uh, law and order. Basically, most of the parties that got elected fundamentally agreed on those things. Where they disagreed, it would be really at the margins. And I was looking for the movements that were outside of that. And the reason is this. Every single thing that we now accept and understand to be our common truths, to be obvious about the way the world works, to be the wisdoms that we hold to be self-evident, were once upon a time derided as foolish, dangerous, radical ideas that were completely unworkable. All of them. But at some point, radical ideas start to inform the mainstream and one day become the mainstream. Now, I can't tell you which ones that will be, but here's the thing. I look at the next... 20 years and the challenges that modern liberal democracies face through artificial intelligence and what it means for jobs, climate change, mass movement of people, control over borders, fiscal crunch and completely changed notions among people that have grown up with the internet about how democracy works. And I do not think that the current centre-left, centre-right consensus 
is a offers answers to those challenges. And I think it's absolutely essential that we begin to think more widely about what is possible in politics. And so for the last two years, I've been going around with all these crazy people to really crazy places. I took psychedelic drugs for this book <laughs> because psychedelics movements are becoming as big, if not bigger, than they were in the late 1960s. Anyone remember Timothy Leary and tuning in and dropping out? Psychedelics movements are going to be one of the big movements of the next 10 years. I'm telling you, I really believe this. And so I was looking across the spectrum, psychedelics movements, radical right-wing groups, hardline environmentalists, Beppe Grillo and his five-star movement, who I interviewed for this book, and who, when I first met him, I walked into the room to interview Beppe Grillo, right? You know who Beppe Grillo is, the leader of the Five Star Movement. In the UK, no one knows who that is, but you're a Brussels audience. And the very first thing he did is he walked in and he picked up his spoon, looked at me, and looked at his spoon and he started bending the spoon and looked at me, looked at the spoon, bending the spoon. And I'm like, what ordinary politician, when they are interviewed by a journalist, the first thing they do is bend a spoon? completely different politician and he's actually a good example of how quickly things can change 2009 the five star movement is set up as a bit of a a bit of a joke to many people as something that we're going to completely replace politics as we know it get rid of political parties we don't need them anymore because of the internet and we're going to replace it with direct democracy using a blog and we're going to have everybody getting involved 2009 founded if there were an election held tomorrow in Italy, Beppe Grillo's party would be the biggest party in Italy. The speed of change is absolutely remarkable. And technology is one of the big drivers for that. Notice how things are getting or feeling like they're getting unpredictable and chaotic. And the internet is one of the reasons for that. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories from this book uh, to illustrate these points, and then we'll open it up. Is anybody in this room um, a transhumanist? Doubt it. You, there is a transhumanist here. You are the first person who's been at one of my events who's actually a transhumanist. Amazing. The one sentence description for transhumanism, it is a movement of people that believe that we can and should use science and technology to dramatically improve human physical and mental capabilities. Whether it's slowing down aging and maybe ending death entirely, or using bionic limbs, introducing artificial intelligence, chips into our brains to learn languages. There is no natural state of man. We're constantly evolving. And aggressively using technology is the next step in our evolution even if that means we become something beyond the human. So, in 2015, I'm approached by a guy who's a transhumanist who's called Zoltan, and that is his real name. It's a perfect name for a transhumanist, but it's his real name. An American, Zoltan, and he says to me, it's a Hungarian name, Zoltan Istvan. He's Californian. Uh, but he's originally from Hungary. His parents were Hungarian, and they fled Hungary in 1968. And he says, I am going to run for president as, a tra as the leader of the transhumanist party. And I thought, this sounds interesting. I'm writing a book. This is exactly what I'm... And he says, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a 1970s bus, and I'm going to change it so it looks like a coffin a big coffin on wheels, and I'm going to call it the Immortality Bus. And I'm going to ride that bus from San Francisco, the home of the tech revolution, to Washington, D.C., as part of a three-month tour to bring the message of transhumanism to the people. And my pitch to the American people is vote for me if you want to live forever. He said, we're going to have transhumanists on the bus, we're going to have robots on the bus, we're going to have VR headsets, we're going to have all sorts, it's going to be amazing. So I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm a journalist, like what is more beautiful than someone riding a bus across America that's a 1970s bus, looks like a coffin, promising immortality? I'm thinking, brilliant. 
So I make my way over to San Francisco, and I find Zoltan ready for the bus tour to begin. But there's no other transhumanists there. There's just a load of other journalists like me who've all turned up because we journalists are so desperate for good stories that he's managed to appeal to all of us. Zoltan was a genius. He basically knew how to appeal to journalists. And it created actually this very strange, this very strange dynamic because Zoltan was traveling across the country. One Saturday, we went into a home depot. This is like just where you get your repairs for your house to buy some paint so he could paint the name or immortality bus on the side of the bus. A very ordinary thing to do, except that there were five journalists following him around with notepads watching what he did, which meant that other people who were shopping would come over and say, who are you? And Zoltan would say, I'm Zoltan and I'm running for president. And they'd say, wow, that's interesting. What are you running as? I'm the leader of the Transhumanist Party. And we'd start writing this down. Oh, this is brilliant, this is brilliant. <laughs> they wouldn't have done it if we weren't there. Journalists created the story that we then reported on. And it's kind of what's happening with journalism at the moment, especially with people like Donald Trump. Journalists are obsessed with exciting, weird, outsider movements at the moment because it's more fun and gets more clicks online when you share that story. Now, Zoltan was, I'm not going to go into the details of, of the trip entirely, except to say he had a RFID chip implanted into his hand, which meant that he could open doors with just doing that, which isn't actually that harder than just opening it with a key, but I uh, don't know, but he did it anyway. But Zoltan's story that he was running as leader of the Transhumanist Party was picked up and reported on by every single major media outlet. The BBC, the Financial Times, the Daily Mail, the Spiegel, the New York Times, the New Yorker did a feature on him. All of whom were reporting the same thing. This man is running as leader of the Transhumanist Party. Here's the catch. The Transhumanist Party didn't exist. He made the whole thing up. It doesn't sound like a big difference, maybe, but he set up a political action committee and called it the Transhumanist Party and pretended it was a political party. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but that's illegal under American law. It's illegal to raise money for a political party that doesn't exist, and it's illegal to say you're a member of a political party that doesn't exist. Did any of the newspapers or the media outlets check any of this? No. Did the BBC check? No. Did the New Yorker check? No. Did I check? No, I didn't check. Someone else told me afterwards, and I was like, oh my God, the whole thing's made up. <laughs> but it didn't matter, because we journalists were far too interested in this exciting story to bother checking the basic details about whether or not there was even a transhumanist party in the first place. So Zoltan, he didn't win the, the election, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Zoltan tricked us all and really beat us because he played the media so well that he took the message of transhumanism to millions of people. It was the most widely reported on third party by a mile uh, in a way that for 25 years the transhumanist party hadn't reached anybody in the same way. He played the media and a lot of radical movements, those outside the middle, are looking constantly about how they can play a game with us journalists, and us journalists too often get beaten by them. Now, the other bit of Zoltan is, when he first got in touch with me in 2015, he said, artificial intelligence, in particular machine learning, which is machines learning how to do things like humans through examples, is very soon going to start meaning millions of jobs will become unnecessary or will be done by software and automated machines. And for capitalism to survive in its current form, we will need some kind of universal basic income or something like that to give to economically useless people, which is going to be millions of us because we will no longer have any competitive advantage over software. Furthermore, life extension technology 
extending average life expectancy is growing at an alarming rate and within about 30 years we will be able to live to 130 or 140. And I thought, Zoltan, you are speaking absolute shit. What are you talking about? I'd never heard of any of this stuff. Now, I don't know whether you have been following the news much lately, but things like the role that artificial intelligence is playing in our economies and things like universal basic incomes as a possibility that is suddenly becoming something that serious people are seriously thinking about particularly the possibilities of more and more software-based companies in driving, trucks in particular, fruit picking, burger flipping, even journalism, heaven forbid. Machines are starting to be able to do those things better than humans can. And we don't really know what that's gonna mean for our economy, particularly our tax paying base. And I'd never thought about any of that stuff before. And it took a man in a ridiculous bus with a made-up political party who was lying, traveling across America with a party that didn't exist to make me think about that stuff. And that's the message of the book. It's those kind of fringe, strange groups that may be full of crap sometimes, that may be exaggerating, that may sometimes be lying slightly, but they are very often onto something. And that if we listen to them with a little bit of respect, and try to understand where they're coming from, it's gonna give us something valuable about how we deal with the future. So that's story number one, Zoltan. I had a lot of fun with Zoltan. But I'll tell you another group I had a lot of fun with, which is story number two. And that's the radical right, the radical anti-Islam groups. Um, do you guys know the English Defence League? Kind of anti-Islam group protesting up and down the country in the UK and sometimes even in Europe as well, founded in 2009. Now, I've been following them for a very long time. And in 2015, the leader of that group, Tommy Robinson, got in touch with me and said, the problem that we had in the English Defence League was that the middle class wasn't listening to us. We were too drunk. We were always shouting and screaming offensive chants and getting into fights and all of that stuff. And so the middle classes wouldn't listen to us. And if this is going to become a serious movement, you know, the West is under threat here. The West is under attack. We need to be appealing to doctors and solicitors and teachers and those families and children. So he said, I'm going to try to create a respectable version of the English Defence League. And he looked over to Germany and he saw Pegida. And he saw this group, Pegida, that were demonstrating every Monday at 8 p.m. in Dresden, often getting 10,000 people, and seeing that they seemed to be a bit more respectable. They weren't drunk. They weren't chanting. There were problems, of course, but he felt they were a model that we could replicate in the UK and across Europe. And again, I'm not going to give you all the bits of the story here, but over the course of one year, he succeeded. He succeeded. He managed to get hundreds of demonstrators to meet at the same time and demonstrate without chanting, without drinking and without fighting. But the problem was that was the reason why people were joining the English Defence League. So people stopped coming. No one was turning up because people were there because they loved the fighting and the chanting and the, and, the, uh, and the drinking. And so it was this strange thing. And the reason this is important, the reason this is so important, is to try to understand what part of the appeal of groups like the English Defence League or Pegida actually is. Now, I spent all this time with the group, traveling across Europe, we went to Dresden, <laughs> We went to Prague, we went to Copenhagen, and we were getting chased around by anti-fascists. We had the police blocking us in, we had bottles being thrown at us, and then we'd go out afterwards and we'd be drinking. And I'm telling you, it's exciting. It is exhilarating. It's thrilling to be part of a movement where you think the whole world is against you, and you're this tiny little group of people that everybody else is trying to silence. This is a social movement. 
This is a kind of football fans traveling together. It's thrilling and it's enjoyable. And on the outside, it looks like a group that's just full of hate. On the inside, it feels like a group that's full of love and everybody on the outside is hating you. And you have to understand that to be able to understand why these groups become popular. And it's not, it's not how people imagine. So I just wanted to throw that in there as a very short example, because I spent a lot of time with direct action environmentalists as well. Does anyone here, a direct, anyone here ever chain themselves to a, a digger and shut anything down? Because I did. <laughs> and um, what was amazing to me was I agreed with the ideas of the environmentalist movement a lot more than I did the ideas of the English Defence League. But I think I'd be more likely to join the English Defence League. And the reason is that the background and behaviour and language and norms and dress sense of the English Defence League is more in keeping with my background than the environmentalists. And that is such an important reason why people actually join movements, radical movements. Because they think that it's a group of people that you might enjoy spending your time with. And let me give you an example from the Direct Action Environmentalist and then I'll move on to my final story, my favourite story. Direct Action Environmentalism is a very, very irrational group to join. Because you are taking a lot of risks you are chaining yourselves to things, risking arrest, in order to stop the planet being destroyed. And if you are successful, everybody else gets to benefit equally from that. But you are the person that took all the risks in doing this. As a result, it has become something of a cultural choice. It's become a movement of people that really opt into it. And it's because it's high risk, it's quite secretive by default, by design, it has to be. What has happened, therefore, is that the movement has created quite a closed culture, a subculture, which wants to be very welcoming, desperately wants other people to join, and goes to great lengths to try to make it an inclusive movement, but accidentally alienates people because a lot of the others look at it and say it's a bunch of white middle-class graduates and I don't really feel welcome there. So they have all of this very, very well thought out uh, decision making procedures, sitting in circles and a bit like Occupy, if anyone's ever followed those movements where you twinkle your fingers to mean I agree and you do this if you disagree and, and they run really long workshops about intersectionality between different oppressed groups. And all of it is with the purpose of making it a very welcoming an open and inclusive movement. And yet it is the most homogenous group I've ever seen. It is all university graduates of the same sort of age with the same sort of clothes. And they are going to desperate lengths to not be like that. And the irony is all of these things that they do to make it welcoming just means that other people turn up and are like, what are you guys doing? You're all crazy. And it's such a tragedy. And it really illustrated to me how, yes, the English Defence League, they're closed and they're homogenous, but it's the same in other groups as well. They have the same kind of people are joining because they feel like it's the group that they might be part of. And I saw a very interesting difference with a group called the anti-fracking. I don't know if you have anti-fracking groups here. It's a very different type of environmentalism. These are the people that are worried about hydraulic fracturing because they think it's going to damage the local water supply especially. And those people are drawn into it because they believe that their local water supply is going to be ruined. And as a result, they are from a very wide cross-section of society. And as a result, they are naturally very welcoming. So you turn up to an activist, like an environmental activist event, and it's all workshops on intersectionality and decision making, you turn up to an anti-fracking one and it's cups of tea and biscuits and uh, everybody's called Angie and you know Maureen and I know those names don't mean much to you but to an English person that's like your grandmother's names and it becomes very naturally welcoming almost by accident. So the key thing for the direct action environmentalists 
is they have to somehow break out of this accidental subculture that they've formed. And the tragedy about it is this. Millions of more people, I think, will start doing direct action environmentalism when they start to feel the effects of climate change in their own gardens and in their own towns, at which point it's too late to change it. And that is the saddest thing about it. And it's very, very frustrating to watch that. And I have some hope with the anti-fracking people, but I just don't know if it's enough. The book is not all optimistic and happy. I know that's probably going to hurt my book sales because you're supposed to write books about how everything's going to be grey and the radicals are going to save us, but I don't believe that's necessarily true. The final story. Has anyone ever heard of Liberland before? Maybe, maybe. That's not my glass, is it? Oh, this is my glass. All right. This is um, Liberland. Liberland is the world's newest country. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. You can decide. There is a seven kilometer square patch of land on the border between Croatia and Serbia, which is disputed territory. But unusually for disputed territory, Croatia says it belongs to Serbia and Serbia says it belongs to Croatia. Never happens that, it's a complete rarity. The reason is the current de facto border between the two countries is the Danube River, as I'm sure you know. Croatia says it should be the 19th century course of the Danube River, which puts loads of Serbian land into Croatia, but this tiny little bit into Serbia. So they say, that's yours. Serbia, perfectly happy with the status quo, says, no, 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 no. The Danube's fine, uh, that bit of land's yours. So this seven square kilometer bit of land is the rarest thing in, in international law. It's a bit of land unclaimed by a sovereign nation state. It, there's no, apart from a little bit of the Arctic and a tiny bit of the Saharan desert, there's nowhere else in the world that's not claimed by a nation state. And according to loosely defined international law, the first person that turns up there and plants a flag in the ground gets to say, this is my land, and I'm starting a new country. And in 2015, a libertarian from the Czech Republic called Vit Jedlička did exactly that. Turns up with a group of friends, sticks a flag in the ground, says, I've got a constitution. Uh, he swears himself in as president and says, this is Liberland, the first truly libertarian country in the world, where taxation will be voluntary, and if you want to commission services, you can get together with some other members and set your own little laws and set your own little taxes and commission services from the free market. No restrictions on what you can own, no restrictions on what you can eat or drugs you can take, guns if you want them, fine. You can become a citizen, you can stop becoming a citizen, it's very easy. And this struck a real chord with people. 200,000 people signed up within a few months for citizenship. He wrote a constitution, he formed a government, he sent official letters to every single head of state in the world, saying, introducing the new country of Liberland. Da -da 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 -da. And um, the Croatian police then stopped him from getting into Liberland. So it's now a patch of uninhabited swampland. Now, Liberland, I went to the one year anniversary of Liberland's founding just outside Liberland because we couldn't get on the, 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 the land itself and the Croatian police stopped us as well on their boat. We tried to get in from Serbia and there was a police boat trying to, uh, it was ridiculous. But it really got me thinking, why do we live in nation states anyway? Nation states meaning land where a group of people with commonly shared characteristics live where there is a single sovereign authority with a single legal system that has authority over that with borders recognized by other nation states. Why do we live like that? Who invented this thing in the first place anyway? Because I'd never even thought about it. I just thought, oh yeah, we've got countries, you know, that's, we, we live in countries. But I'd never really taken to thinking why or whether that's the only way of living or whether 
actually it's a relatively modern invention and if we were to start again we might design something slightly differently so take this as an example all of us in the room we're 50 of us or so whatever and we believe in the consent of the governed that's the moral underpinning of democracy and we decided well fine let's the 50 of us declare some kind of independence set our own rules we're adults we can do what we want and decide that we're going to live by our own rules and we don't need the nation state's security or their roads or their infrastructure and we don't want to pay their taxes either we want to set our own system up because we're adults and the consent of the governed we can't do that not only can we not do that we can't do that anywhere in the world it's not possible because nation states have a monopoly on the entire planet and so Witt was tr is trying to create something that while still a nation state really is much more libertarian, that it gives much more freedom to people to make their own sets of rules. So I went to this one year anniversary conference full of hope, wondering what it would be like. And the way that you become a nation state is that other nation states say you are a nation state. Basically, it's like a, it's a cartel really. So they let you in if you are one, which means that he is doing everything he can to look like a nation state. So I go into this one year anniversary conference and there's the Minister of Finance is there and there's the uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs is there, the Chancellor is there. Vit's not there because the police have detained him in Serbia because they think he's a threat to national security, which is ridiculous. And there's, a, there's dozens of representatives, Liberland representatives, to Pakistan, to Palestine, to the Canary Islands, to Spain, to the UK, to Brussels. The, and they've created this like government in waiting. So in addition to their constitution, which you can go and find online, they also have a football team, they have an air traffic controller, they have an aeroplane, they have a fleet of boats, they have a national beer, they have a national wine. Everything that you can kind of try to imagine makes a nation state a nation state. They are trying to create, except they can't get on the land itself because it's still just a swamp. So Witt's plan is this, that he's going to keep lobbying, he's going to keep trying to get arrested, he's going to keep causing trouble until one country recognises him and then using that as leverage He'll try and get another country to recognize him and then he thinks a chain reaction will start now i don't think so <laughs> i don't think so but there are millionaire backers of liberland because the libertarian philosophy that he follows is one that is shared by a lot of people in silicon valley and silicon valley is now probably the most important 20 square miles on the earth developing, building technology that is transforming our lives according to a philosophy that is very similar to Witt's. And they are funding some of the things that he is doing. Think about some of the technology that has emerged in the last 10 years. Smartphones, the greatest libertarian device ever invented. Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies that states can't really control. Blockchain, which is the underlying technology of Bitcoin, which means uncensorable databases that governments can't really control. And ask yourself whether VIT really is so mad. Because to me, the tendency that we're heading towards is going to be a libertarian direction. And things like what VIT is trying to do is to say that the nation state is getting weaker. It's not going to be able to control its borders forever. In fact, it's not even going to be here forever. Why should it be? Why does the nation state have a right to exist forever? And the pressures that it's under in the next 20 years means it's one day going to disappear. What will replace it? Well, something like Liberland, he thinks. No, I don't think so. And in fact, I'll be honest with you, a lot of the ideas in the book are pretty crazy. They're pretty out there. But that is their value as well, because they're forcing you they force me to think about them. They force me to imagine something different. Think about things that I'd never thought about before. 
even the radical ideas with which I utterly disagreed were as valuable as the ones with which I agreed. Because to me, those radical ideas that I disagree with force me to work out what I believe, what I think. The great danger that I see is that liberal democracies become a kind of narrower and narrower set of consensus ideas that no one dares disagree with and no one can imagine anything different. And like I said at the beginning, the challenges that we face in the next 20 years, including the things that Zoltan talked about and the sorts of technology that VIT in Liberland is developing and the environmentalist problem that the environmentalists are worried about, those things are going to come together 10, 20 years time and I think put unprecedented strain on the way that we do things now. And I don't think we are set up to deal with those challenges. And whether you agree with them or not, radical ideas I think are going to be the way that will help us imagine something different, to help us imagine whether we agree with them or not, imagine a way that the world could be different. And without those radical ideas then democracy just atrophies it becomes meaningless. We don't have citizens that really care about things anymore. And so the one message from this book is that we should start, at the very least, widening slightly our horizons about what are and what are not acceptable political ideas and listen respectfully and thoughtfully even to those groups that seem to be talking absolute nonsense because for some of them in 10 years time you'll realize that they were actually right all along and with that i'll stop and thank you very much for listening <laughs>